Hello and welcome to Microbiology Journal Club, where you know out big about all things small. Hi, my name is Danny. In a previous life, I dropped out for my PhD in microbiology. Then I was a fact checker for farmers school advertisers. And nowadays, I'm the, a member and the president of Biotech Without Borders, a nonprofit based in NYC, dedicated to the public with the tools of biotech. My name is Faz. I have a PhD in microbiology. I've mostly worked in bacteria, but I've also worked as a research integrity specialist, and I'm currently working uh, as an editor for a scientific journal. Every other week, we meet to talk about microbiology, and on a typical week like today, we do an overview of some of the coolest microbiology papers that we've seen in the last two weeks. And uh, and when and um, we want we want to do like deep dives, but we want to help your help in selecting which paper you're most interested in, in order to uh, do a deep dive into, so we can look at it figure by figure, look at the supplementary, maybe look at how it was reviewed. So, maybe message us mm -hmm. at microtwsjc if you're interested in hearing about that. Yeah, you can follow along with the papers that we discuss uh, in our shared Zotero library, our social media handles, and the link to the library are in the doobly-doo below. And we want to hear from you, so please use the comments or tweet us at microtwjc. Uh, so what kind of papers do we have today, Danny? All right, so today I found, or like in the last two weeks, I found something about bacteria and fungi competing in a fractal maze, um, starving bionic algae of oxygen to make hydrogen phage tail-like structures that protect streptomyces from stress, bacteria infecting bacteria that reshape the cell walls, and photosynthetic microbial communities inside of granules. Oh, and not only that, we also have the discovery of dormant viruses and protists. We have uh, a look at how evolution uh, occurs by looking at how surface can compatibility can hurt, occur seemingly by luck. Uh, then we look into corals and the viruses that infect them and why fish poop is very important to corals and how we can protect corals from potentially bleaching events using probiotics. Um, mm. So without further ado, let me switch over and we can get a look at some of these papers. Uh-huh. Yeah, I think the first one we have on the docket is this large-scale invasion of unicellular eukaryotic genomes by integrating DNA viruses. Yeah, so integrating, so integrating G DNA viruses are a big thing for studying human evolution, because in the human genome, there are lots of, there are viruses that, as part of their life cycle, integrate into the genome. So one of the big, big ones we might have heard of is HIV. In order, as part of its replication mm. cycle, it enters into the, into the genome. And sometimes viruses yeah. like that can enter into the germline. So let's say yeah. one person. So yeah. it's, a whole, it's a whole class of viruses that integrate into the genome. Like retroviruses. Yeah. So yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I think there's like some es estimations that uh, a certain like percent thing like there's a huge percentage of, of the human genome that is made up of net retroviruses, uh, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's it's really important as a tool to like study how human evolution has happened and even because let's say our one ancestor gets an, a retrovirus in this genome, every one of its offspring. If it, get, if it enters into a germline cell, everyone that's offspring will also have that virus, which means that you can actually yeah. kind of check the relatedness of different different uh, species based on where they've got the same retrovirus in the same place, or mm -hmm. and maybe even measure like the mutation rate to see like what what's happening at an evolutionary at a molecular level. Um, yeah. it, it's kind of wild too with, because I think um, people say that. Uh, these like it, viral insertions sometimes like if they're held long enough sometimes they get repurposed into different things right they can like activate genes that weren't active before um, so it really is like a like a, an element of evolution in terms of adding variation into genomes like the having things inserted yeah yeah exactly uh, I mean the only example I can think of is in bacteria where the various like virus pages gave rise to the type 4, type 3, so, like, secretion systems. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you see similar things with, hu I mean, it, with human evolution as well, but I can't think of any example that comes directly to mind at this I, moment. I remember uh, them. I think, <laughs> I remember the ones that they teach in classrooms, at least. There's, like, the placental, like, uh, something on the placenta has, like, a fusion, uh -huh. like, looks like a fusion protein from a, from a virus. Um, oh. I think I'm told that like uh, the amylase, like um, right, we have amylase that's expressed in our saliva, and that's like a gene duplication and some sort of like viral fusion mm. potentially. Anyways, just some random examples. <laughs> yeah. So one thing that's been very odd is that protists. Ha it's been very difficult to find viral elements in protists. Mm. So there have been some issues finding them. So this research focuses on looking at pr protists, these unicellular eukaryotes that kind of exist on their own and figuring out 
like why why don't they have some uh, as many viral integrations as you as you'd expect? Mm -hmm. And so they looked in deep and they looked uh, looked for endoviral endogenous viral elements mm -hmm. from uh, from the viruses uh, that that they tend to be infected by. And this is another interesting part because they tend to be infected by giant viruses. So when yeah, you think about yeah. these proteins. Right. Yeah. Like I think amoeba, it was like amoeba where they first found the mini virus or whatever. That's the first giant virus. And then in some episodes we've talked about, like, this is like a ongoing thing now. Like once you start, once we found one, it was, we started finding more just because we knew what to look for in the genome. So, yeah, I think that's the, the key thing that's helped is that, that we now know what to look for because uh, these giant viruses, they tend to mimic bacteria. So, Bacteria, back, so the protists that go and eat bacteria mm. get accidentally ingest one of these viruses, and then the virus ends up taking over. And so, now that we've got like a much better understanding of the kind of viruses that that infect these uh, unicellular eukaryotes, we can better look for the kind of fragments of what. So, I think the main thing they look for are the major cap capsid proteins. So, the capsid proteins are the proteins that live on the surface of the virus, mm -hmm. and and so. Once you can find the genes for them, you can kind of figure out what kind of virus uh, exists on them. Uh, and so they found that, that, that these viruses had these, uh, these major capsid proteins, but also that they tended to be hidden through uh, rep repetitive, difficult, difficult to assemble regions of the unicellular genome. Um, I think partly because they cause those, I think it's kind of insinuated in the paper that these MCPs, those uh, difficult to assemble regions, because they have many repeats. And when you have many repeats mm. in a sequence, it it means that uh, sometimes you can like lose count of where you are in the genome, especially if you've got lo your genome chopped up into lots of short pieces, as we have to do uh -huh. for next generation sequencing. Uh -huh. um, so sometimes you, you just sequence a fragment of the major capsid protein, but it's quite hard to figure out where it lies on the genome, because mm. you've only got that one fragment. And since there are lots of them, um, in the genome, and so it's quite hard to resolve them. Um, yeah, like you know, if you're if you're sequencing everything through small fragments, and the small fragments are repeating, it's really hard to know where those things get assembled. How do you assemble all those small pieces together? Yeah, it's like when you're doing a jigsaw puzzle, and and the bits the when you've got like a figure, but the bits that are always hard to assemble are the backgrounds or sky pieces, which all look the same. Yes. Kind yes. Of, yes. <laughs> that's kind of what this is like. Where you've got uh -huh. pieces that look look the same. So in order to resolve them, they had like long, long. They they did some long reads to mm. on uh, a few selected members of the uh, yep. unicellular eukaryotes, and they and based on that, they could better understand where they, not only like where they were in the gene, but also what genes were near them. So I think that mm. can with that gives them an extra thing to look out for 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 the genome. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I mean, this sort of stuff is this was also like, uh, like, as, as uh, Faz, you were saying, like, this is something that they haven't looked at in the unicellular eukaryotes before, but in multicellular eukaryotes, people have been looking for these and using techniques. So it really is something where it's like these techniques were, uh, were developed, I guess, working on right these multicellular genomes. And now uh, we're saying, like, why shouldn't this exist inside of the unicellular world as well? And people just haven't uh, people haven't looked. And so this is like a, a chance to go in and look. And also we know more about the different structures of viruses, right? This giant virus thing. So yeah, helping us find things that were essentially just right under our nose, which, which maybe is the story of a lot of science. <laughs> yeah. And there are all the neat, neat techniques they used. Uh, so, so sometimes like we don't necessarily know the, so we, for, I think so for some case they looked at shape basing. So they went by based on like the, the the structure of of the protein. So they looked at the genome and sequenced mm -hmm. parts of it, and and kind of so, derived the protein that would be created, and looked at whether that protein would be similar to a major capsid protein in order mm -hmm. to find uh, new new MC new major capsid proteins. So it was a way to find like the structure of virus capsids that they've never seen before. That yeah. so they wouldn't have the sequence because they may have belonged to a virus uh, that's long yeah. gone, gone extinct. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, lots of very little clever techniques here. Um, but yeah, yeah I, I think if you to... throw us to figure four, they have, like, just like a, I don't know, a very messy network graph. <laughs> it looks yeah. kind of cool. But, but this is, like, 
um, an example of like the diversity that they're able to find like all these different viral groups and then the color of the dots I think um, relate to the eukaryotic the single cell eukaryotes that they're coming from yeah I mean this is the, the cool thing about when we find something new out in nature we, we have all this data that's kind of sitting somewhere and we can go back and ask new questions of that data and discover new things that we wouldn't have mm -hmm. ordinarily found out and this paper is a great example of why having that kind of data that's open and available for everyone to use is a really valuable resource. Totally, totally. Okay, so let's, I'm going to segue into the next paper. And, and Fuzzy, you yes. already helped a little bit. You said um, in bacteria, there's this history of uh, phages getting incorporated into the genome and then getting co-opted into different structures, um, so like secretion systems. And so this paper is called Intracellular Phage Tail-like Nanostructures Affect Susceptibility of Streptomyces Lividens to Osmotic Stress. Um, yeah, and just as you were saying, like this is a, so. Yeah, I'm used to thinking about uh, contractile phage systems as for injection, because like that's what mm. they are in phage. So bacteria kind of used it for the same thing. Um, I was also looking through like our back catalog of stuff that we talked about, and um, in February 20, 2022, we talked about this these same types of nanostructures being found inside of algae, and mm. having them be like a they were also cytoplasmic, or they, they also weren't anchored to the cell wall. And when they get released, they like, um, they lice things around them. <laughs> and like, it was like maybe like a defense molecule or something like this. Um, yeah. But I think in this paper, they say that the, well, the structures, again, they aren't on the, they're not in the surface. So they're not like getting injected into, uh, into cells. But I'm not even sure if they're able to do injection, uh, these, the particular ones that they find here. Mm. Um, and so the question really is, is what do they do? And so, yeah, they find them at the tips of hyphae um, and they do some like protein biochemistry. They do these co-localization studies to see like what they're co-localizing with and what gets pulled down from them. And what they see is they get pulled down um, some like ribosome proteins, some peptidoglycan remodeling mm. sort of proteins. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's kind of weird. Like, I guess it's a, they're like a scaffold, maybe. They don't really get to the point. <laughs> like, they, they don't get to the understanding of truly what this strange structure is doing. But they do associate with a phenotype, um, which is uh, this osmotic stress. So if they don't have these uh, phage tail-like proteins, then they don't do so well um, on certain types of media. And also, I think they can get, like, invaded by other in co-culture easier, something like that. Yeah. I think the interesting thing is how these like ancestrally viral proteins have been co-opted to do something that's very different from what you would expect them to do. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they're not there to inject. They're there almost like as a structural component that supports like um, the association of other proteins together. Yeah. Yeah. Which I, I think well, which... is, is quite oh. an interesting mystery. Yeah. It, that's that's sort of why I picked it out because I thought it was an interesting mystery. I, I don't really like I've never really thought about like whether or not um, yeah phage tail like proteins could could touch ribosome like proteins and, and touch peptidoglycan. That's just a, such a bizarre um, yeah. It's not what I would expect, and I thought that was interesting. Um, I guess the other thing that I want to say is that they yeah like it maybe like in eukaryotes we do have scaffolding things. I mean it's a very common idea for a protein right bring together the stuff that needs to work together in order to make something go um and you can imagine like a, these phage tail proteins they have like repeating structures so maybe that's a type of scap you know like that has the evolutionary raw material to to go in and, and bring things together i don't know I've just got, i mean i get the impression of like imagine someone who's been recruited to a company and they're really overqualified for this like oh we know you can do an assassin role, but we need to stand here and hold a book. I feel like that's kind of the role that this protein <laughs> has. It can do other things, but what the cell needs right now is something structural. So it's just like, yeah, sit in there. Yeah. Don't, don't care what you could otherwise do. It's just for what we really need right now, we just need to stand in the corner and be, give us shade for the light. Or so that's <laughs> right. <laughs> that's kind of the vibe I'm getting with this this uh, phage tail like protein, where it's like. Yeah. It, it doesn't have to, the function doesn't necessarily have to be like is and phage because it's still got other things that are useful to the cell. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I think that's all I really want to say about it. But 
again, there's so many examples of, of this of this sort of stuff happening in evolution. And I think it really challenges people's imagination to try to imagine, right? Like what what could be used for a different purpose? Like how do you think so? And that's of course like you know, evolution happens over so many millions of years or whatever. So like is a lot of time to find like those little things. But for scientists trying to make hypotheses, well, I mean, this would be one of the ways to go about it, right? Mm. They're just on purely like physical association trying to figure out like what it goes. So they have a phenotype, they have other proteins it associates to, what does it do? Um, yeah. But, yeah, hopefully we'll see more from them. <laughs> uh, I guess that will bring us to the next paper, which is, mm -hmm. ooh, an MLT-like lytic, lytic transglycosylase secreted by Bedello vibrio bacteriovorus cleaves prey septum during predatory invasion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, excited about this paper. I was actually inspired to pick this one because it, in the last episode, we, we also talked about Bedello vibrio, um, but we didn't get to talk too much about their life cycle. <laughs> and so yeah. this paper, <laughs> oh yeah, go ahead. I oh, know we talked about the least interesting thing about Bedelli vibrio, which was, oh, how does it wrap its GDN up? Oh, it's got some histone-like proteins, perhaps? Yeah, and yeah. <laughs> it, it eats all the bacteria. That's cool stuff. We need to delve into that. So yeah, I can understand. Yeah. <laughs> I was just like, yeah, I mean, it is interesting the fact that we hadn't found those proteins in bacteria before, but this bacteria has a particularly, a very unique lifestyle where it lives inside or it, like it gains entry into the periplasm of gram negative bacteria. And then it like creates a, I think they call it like a bedelloplast or something. Like it basically, yeah. it's, it circularizes the, the rod shaped bacteria. And that gives it, I think like a better like volume ratio so it can multiply inside of, uh, inside of it. And then it multiplies in a really weird way. I think it grows as like a filament. And then when it's all ready to, that, uh, to burst out, it all like pinches off and then it explodes the, it explodes the, the outer membrane and it goes on to infect other things. Um, yeah, so it's just like a hilariously interesting bacteria. And so this, this paper, um, is asking, uh, some questions about, um, uh, peptidoglycan modeling enzymes. Like it needs these enzymes in order to punch through different layers. Uh, so we know that it definitely has a bunch, <laughs> but, uh, they just haven't studied some subset of them. You know, there's, there's, there's so many different versions of peptidoglycan remodeling proteins in these bacteria, they decided to focus on one, one section of them. And what they find, uh, if we can go down to figure, the next figure, figure B, actually, A, you know, yes, B in figure this one. B. Yeah. Oh, right. So they have a deletion of one of these peptidoglycan remodeling enzymes, and they see, oh, actually, when we delete it out of Bedella Vibrio, and we look at the things that are infecting. So here, Bedella Vibrio is in red because I think it's RFP tank or something like that. Yeah. Um, they see that a bunch of, they don't, they don't all become spheres anymore. Some of them become rods, stay as rods, or become weird dumbbell shapes. Um, and that's very curious to them. And so this, this lets them know that, okay, while this, uh, while this peptoglycan remodeling enzyme isn't important for getting in to the cell, and presumably, like, probably there's still some infecting cycles and stuff like that, it is doing something at one stage of this whole thing, or to some subset of cells, because it's also only some of the cells where this is happening. Um, yeah, and they, they try to figure out why. Uh, um, I think they come to, they, they do it, like, sort of, like, time course things, and they're, like, watching, like, um, they're they're just looking at like the sequence of events like can they see this in other conditions um mm. it doesn't matter if the bacteria are dividing or not and that's where they get their first or that's where they get their major hint is that it's only in these dividing e coli do they see the the particular remodeling enzyme uh get uh, localized in a specific area um yes yeah so that's this figure and, and yeah, and so, so this, at this, and so this specific peptidoglycan remodeling enzyme works at a specific stage of E. coli division. <laughs> and you can imagine that the Della Vibrio, when it first accesses the outside of a cell, it doesn't know like the state or it do, that doesn't necessarily know what the state of the cell is when it accesses it from the outside. And so the authors are hypothesizing that, you know, this is important because 
you could be infecting a non-dividing cell. You could be infecting like a dividing E. coli, and the peptidoglycan is going to look different in 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 those two scenarios. Um, mm. And so this parasite or this you know yeah intracellular parasite of bacteria needs an enzyme for every occasion. <laughs> like no matter what state the peptidoglycan is in uh, in these E. coli, uh, the Bedella virus has to act on it in some ways, and like in different stages, like the peptidoglycan has a different structure. Um, mm. I don't know how much we talk about peptidoglycan, but it's a single molecule is, is I think the, the way people think about it, like one molecule that wraps up the whole uh, bacterial cell. And, mm. and so it's very complicated when you think about how do you split one molecule into two during cell division, there has to be mm. like a bunch of different, like, um, like snipping and stuff like that. So you have like different overhangs. Um, yeah, anyways, this is a, uh, so they found a new enzyme that interacts with peptidoglycan. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, I've said this before, but this is virus behavior. It goes into a cell, starts chewing it up, and, uh -huh. but yeah, it's interesting because like peptidoglycan is a very complicated matrix as well. So like they're, it's all, it's in all sorts of different conformations, I think I, so yeah, this, and yeah, I think it is quite interesting to see like these dumbbell shaped bacteria being produced because really it wants it to be circular and so it has mm -hmm. to like tease out all these different bits and com different combinations so yeah fascinating <laughs> yeah it's like uh it, i think you don't always think about the complexity that if you have an intracellular lifestyle you have to have like a really close like relation you have to have a really close relationship to the thing that you're investing uh, that you're infecting um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, some might say it's amazing, which is my segue into the next paper. <laughs> yeah, so this paper is kind of ridiculous. I don't know. I I was very when I first saw the title of it, I'm like, why are why are they doing this? <laughs> um, the paper is called "Habitat Complexity Affects Microbial Growth in a Fractal Maze." Um, so the reason they use fractal mazes is because I guess there's like a mathematical. Um, way of representing fractal mazes uh, like a property that you can adjust is how um how how many branches how many like unique branching points are there uh that like lead to dead ends essentially like <laughs> how inaccessible are some mazes because they keep branching until you get to little dead ends and so that's what the fractal maze is accomplishing it gives the investigators a range of physical geometries essentially that range from mostly all interconnected to more difficult to get to because there's lots of dead ends. And um, that the investigators imagine that's a model for like a soil ecosystem. And so we talked about that mm. cyborg soil. We had a yeah. deep dive about that, um, like specifically making, and this is like in some ways like a, a extension of that idea, right? Where they have this abstract, you know, prefabricated system that we made in a lab, microfluidic maze, and they just adjust this property of is it more interconnected or does it have more dead ends? And then they see, do bacteria, they compare bacteria and fungi growing them to get a sense of like, I don't know, what are the properties of bacteria and fungal fungus when they're, uh, in, when they encounter these types of mazes. Um, yeah. And they find, and so like, I guess they find that, um, they act a bit differently <laughs> bacteria and fungus, which I guess maybe is not, too strange to imagine because like um like the fungus it has like a, hyph a hyphae so it's like seeking the, the point is like seeking out right where it's supposed to go and bacteria they kind of just like spread in some ways um and, and but they have but bacteria have like quorum sensing systems so they're like talking to each other anyways they just they live very differently and so they they have they, yeah it's maybe not surprising that they spread differently through um through these through these mazes yeah, so I'm going to like pull up the bacteria, because I showed the fungi earlier, where you can almost see like these tendrils searching things around, whereas mm -hmm. bacteria mm -hmm. kind of flood the area, and you can just see them growing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's almost like a, a, a very different way of like solving, solving the maze, because I think bacteria is like, carried with the fluid, uh, mm -hmm. whereas with mm -hmm. the fungi, you can almost like... Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pull up more videos later, but with the bacteria, it's very chilled out. They just kind of like take up all the space whereas a fungi you can sense frustration i feel like <laughs> yeah. the, the bacteria are operating as like individual units here 
uh, whereas the fungi almost like because they are hi they're in hi-fi they are interconnected and so there is some like like almost communication there i mean you look at this it's like a little city we're looking at where you see little bacteria floating around into different places mm -hmm. they're not like they're, they're very chilled out they're not so whereas uh i mean yeah part of the yeah so they the, fun the bacteria can go into all the nooks and crannies whereas the fun fungus uh, are just like you just you can see the, the fungus uh i mean this is a low complexity one but as it gets more complexity, you see them, the fungi end up in dead ends. You can almost, I, I never felt more empathy for, for, for fungus <laughs> than watching this. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, I think the comment in chat is good. Like, this is like an emergent behavior thing, right? Like, it's the property, like, it's, they don't have, from what we understand of bacteria and fungus, like, it's not they have an overarching understanding of the maze structure that they're going through. But, like, mm -hmm. the way that they behave in, like, the small scale like determines their the ultimate behavior on this larger scale of, of the maze itself. Um, and, and I guess like the reason why these, again, back to why this might be important to learn um, is because it thinks that like we could, we can learn, we can understand more about what governs fungi and bacteria in the soil if we understood these like high level principles of how they decide to move around. And they even do like a competition experiment, I think, which touches on I don't think we did a deep dive on this, but there's definitely like some paper in the Zotero about like um, fungal highways or something like this, where like bacteria can like move along the fungal hyphae, like the water uh, that sort of like yeah, accumulates on a fungal hyphae, it can like move through. Yeah. I feel we did definitely cover that. I can't remember the exact paper, but uh, well, but basically the fungi, because they're big hyphae, they can like crush the open areas of the soil and link, yep. between, link micro environments together. So mm -hmm. I don't know the exact paper. Um, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. but, but like essentially they do, yeah, they do Sorry. the same thing in the competition experiment, right? And they they actually they tease out like another understanding where it's like actually also bacteria sometimes can't get into spaces that get blocked off by like the fungal yeah. hyphae, yeah, which is also like an interesting complexity, right? Like there's just like so many little things that are happening, um, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> But yeah, there's a lot of like quite long videos on this paper, but there, it is quite fun to. I like, I love when you have papers like this that show like things happening in real time. Yeah, um, the, dyna the dynamics of it. <laughs> um, and I think it's like it's so funny to think that this is this is part of this is a research. This is science research, like making mazes, watching these things go through. If you're able to generalize, like this is the search for these like generalized laws, right, or like some approximation or estimation of like this emergent behavior um yeah like it can be useful or like at least yeah. like if you can if you can justify how it could be useful then, then you could do the study and hopefully get some funding for it i mean i think it is i mean for soil science it is very useful and especially like i mean thinking even bigger like say terraforming where you're looking at soils mm -hmm. of, di of different components understanding how a uh, fungus or bacteria might might be interacting to colonize those soils, I think is very, uh, a very interesting question. And these mm -hmm. models allow us uh, a test bed that we can use to look at test hypotheses about how these uh, various, uh, how they interact with each other and yeah, how yeah. that can affect nutrient flows. So mm -hmm. I think we are learning a lot about this. I mean, from this paper, I think the idea of like the granularity of soils and the ability, the, I think how that can affect the, whether a fungus or a bacteria is going to survive there better. Yeah, yeah, this, an... yeah, this interconnectivity, right? Like it, it matters how accessible or inaccessible things are that that drives different phenomena. Um, I was going to say, not that all science has to have like explicit application, but you could also imagine that part of the application here is like engineering principles. Like I've, I've seen, I think I saw on social media somewhere like. Um, people like make like artificial soil granules and then colonize them with bacteria and fungi. So like mm. uh, as a way of trying to encourage certain types of bacterial fungal growth, like maybe this type of research helps design those granules better, right? Because like, you know, like what something prefers, what some organism prefers over another. Yeah. yeah. And another thing is like, let's say like, I'm, I'm thinking about the next generation of bioreactors where we decide to like, create communities of of bacteria and fungi to interact with each other on a, on a certain scale and then 
being able to manage the, that, I think having structures like this to segregate like different bacteria and fungi from different areas might be quite helpful in, in that. Totally. All right, so let's move on. Um, we've got high resolution functional analysis of and community structure of photogranules. So yeah, actually maybe this is a, this is a, that was a great segue because in some ways the this is talking about an, um, a specific structure that a bacterial community forms in, and these structures are called photogranules. They come from wastewater treatment, um, mm. which is sort of gross, I guess, um, but also fascinating that you know there's lots of nutrients in wastewater, and one of the main ways that wastewater treatment approaches this is it uses microorganisms to digest those nutrients into something that they can release into the environment, right? Or it's something that can be harvested and used in another way. Um, and so there's a specific structure that it forms in wastewater treatment plants, specifically when they're being bubbled and they're full of cyanobacteria, is the, the bacteria like kind of glom up together in these aggregates um, that are photosynthetic, thus photogranules. Um, mm -hmm. And here's like a really beautiful uh, confocal light scanning image of, uh, of a photogranule. And you can see that there are sort of different structures, right, on the outside. Well, the outside, you can really clearly mm. see it's like covered in nucleic acid. So, you know, organisms are there, maybe also dead organisms are there, right, like making this sticky matrix on the outside. And then you have like longer forms on the inside, which I think are some of the filamentous forms of these uh, cyanobacteria, um, the phycobilins, right, I think are mm. a marker to sort of see one type of uh, cyanobacteria, long, stretchy, <laughs> um, connecting the outside to the inside. And yeah, these, uh, these scientists, they just want to know, like, they want to know about the structure because they see these globs floating inside of wastewater treatment plants. And they're like, well, let's understand them better because maybe if we understand them, we can engineer them, we could, you know, assess their health, we could control their growth rate, like these types of things. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, oh, yeah, go ahead. sorry, no, I, I mean, I find some of the techniques they use quite interesting. Like, so uh -huh. I think for, they use like sensors to like pierce into the photogranules to, sorry, to measure gases like oxygen and mm -hmm. carbon dioxide and nitrogen to, to test hypotheses on like photosynthesis and other, other things, which I find quite fascinating. Um, yeah, totally. Yeah. Like this picture that you're showing right now, they essentially, they take a photogranule and they, they, they pin it down to a Petri dish and they like slowly pierce it with this probe, a micro probe that's able to measure, um, what is it here? It's, oh, it's, it's light. <laughs> so they're just seeing how the light gets through. But I think they also, they also have other probes. They look at like nitrogen, right? They look at like oxygen stuff. Like they have all these different ways of like testing with micro probes. Yeah. Um, to figure out like what's going on inside of them. Yeah, and they almost find like an ecosystem where there's like nitrification, carbon fixation, and photosynthesis all happening in these photogranules. Um, yeah, and at different and at different layers. Yes. I think is like the key part. Like they're they're spatially segregated in this particular um, yeah in this particular thing. And, I mean that is important because different enzymes have different sensitivities to things. I mean that's like my <laughs> lead into the next paper. Um, but but yeah, but but just to speak more about these photogranules is. Um, yeah, it, it sort of makes sense that they're going to have a very unique structure in this way because they have to do some rather specific things. And to speak to the question in chat, like, I think you probably could keep them in a home aquarium. Um, yeah. I, I mean, first of all, like, I don't think you'd want to use wastewater necessarily. That might be kind of like a potentially dangerous thing if you're there, if you don't have good separation, right? Like, and you're just bubbling your own wastewater away to <laughs> in hopes to see photogranules but like uh in the materials and methods here they talk about what it's done i'm sure you could yeah. dig into it they say it's a the bioreactor is a bubble column that's about 40 centimeters high and 10 centimeters in diameter so that is basically an aquarium <laughs> yeah I, I, um but yeah but they're using i think like samples from the netherlands wastewater treatment plants to mm -hmm. inoculate their, their 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 reactors so yeah i don't know what food you would put in that like maybe it's just like a little bit safer and more appropriate for home use. Yeah. Um, but I don't see a reason why you wouldn't be able to create these objects in your home. I think the the key thing is trying to make sure that they don't settle. So like, because uh, these granules are similar to I think when you have oh, like nice. a culture and you see like bacteria just coming out of it, 
feel these gangs are quite sim. So they have to like keep like cycling through. Uh, so if I wrote because um, I think there's like a, a, a an equation to that they have for for creating uh, photogranules where essentially like you need the flow rate to be um, above a certain level to make sure that you don't they don't settle, but not too far. So so not. So not too fast, so that there is that sweet spot where they mm -hmm. they aren't just washed away immediately. Um, I, sorry, I just looked at my notes and I wrote down photogranules are just pretentious biofilms. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. I I mean that's what they are. They're they they have that same right that intracellular or the extracellular matrix that's binding them together is the same stuff you would find in a biofilm. But because these guys are under some level of agitation, they don't get to stick to the side. They have to stick to each other. Yeah, uh, but they they do find them. So they found things in nature because I know like that in their in their like uh, introduction they wrote about have finding green and pink microbial berries found in salt marshes that are effectively photogranules. Um, yes. <laughs> so that wording is just hilarious too. Like the ba bacterial berries. Mm, delicious. It doesn't, sound, uh, <laughs> it doesn't sound tasty. I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's, that's all I want to say about that. And, and as I was sort of hinting there, um, like as a segue, like, uh, there's segregation in these, uh, in these granules because different enzymes have different sensitivities to different compounds. And so in the next paper, um, which is called, uh, algal cell bionic, algal cell bionics as a step towards photosynthesis independent hydrogen production. Um, in, in this paper, they're specifically trying to emphasize the function of a hydrogenase, which is, mm. um, which is an enzyme that can take electrons and, and plop them into hydrogen, thus making hydrogen, ga hydrogen gas. Um, and, and that enzyme is, is sensitive to oxygen <laughs> because oxygen is like a much better acceptor of electrons than, than hydrogen is. <laughs> um, and so... And, and so in this in this particular um, in this particular paper, they tried to add in, and we've seen this in some previous papers as well. They tried to add in like a inorganic structure on top of the algal cells in order to starve them of oxygen, so that they can keep doing, so they can do more of this hydrogenase production, um, in the hope of uh, I think making like you know biohydrogen essentially. This is like mm. the energy of the future is being imagined. Uh, with, with these bionic cells. And so, yeah, the, the picture you have up, Fuzz, is like, I just think it's like really crazy <laughs> like what they end up doing. Because the cell wall, I guess that's cellulose, but it also has lots of nooks and crannies. And they're able to just like place in this, um, I don't know, what, what's the compound that they put in it? Iron? No. Yeah. Uh, P-P-Y-C-A-3. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's some sort I of... I don't polypyro. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's some sort of iron compound, and and that compound is going to um, ensure that the oxygen can't get into the lower layers of the cell, and so I guess they're suffocating them <laughs> if you really think about it that way. Um, they also, I think, the layer is also helping regulate pH in a certain way, is what they hmm. find, um, and in doing so, they uh, allow this hydrogenase enzyme to be more active than it previously has been. Um, in, in these cells. And yeah, and that's going to be useful for making bio-based hydrogen. Yeah, it's, it is it is interesting. The photosynthetic reaction is basically you get hydrogen plus, uh, no, so you get water plus carbon dioxide to create your glucose and, and carb, mm -hmm. carb fixing carbon. But almost this one is like trying to find a way to make that reaction, create a hydrogen, molecular hydrogen mm -hmm. and and the way i interpret the the lack of acidification means that because acids are just made of hydrogen ions right so yes yes if you want to create biohydrogen you don't want you want those hydrogen ions to make hydrogen and you don't want them to be wasted in creating acids because that also mm -hmm. messes with other reactions so mm -hmm. yeah um yeah that's that's exactly the case and like i guess it's a very small amount of the reaction is normally happening right in, in an oxic environment. But, mm. um, but yeah, like, uh, the artificial coating that they're able to put on these algal cells is then directing. So it's still the light energy of the set, uh, right. They're still using the photosynthesis, the photosystems 
to take in light energy from from the sun or whatever. Um, but then instead of taking those electrons and dumping them into the chain that ends up in oxygen, um, it's going to dump into a chain that ends up in hydrogen. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So yeah, we're seeing a lot of these papers where the people are coating bacteria and algae with all sorts of things. So I think last time we we're looking at photovoltaics. I think we've looked at microbial backpacks. There's a lot of like research going into this. And yeah, it seems it's like, like it's treating cells as just as like the starting particles um, in order to build more complicated microstructures, right? Like, yeah, that, at least that's how I see yeah. it. Like. And maybe that's why this term bionics or cyborg is like really useful for these these types of things because we're taking this like biological life thing like yeah look at this image of like like the cell makes that right like that's not something we make right a membrane embedded with different proteins that all like cooperate in order to move electrons from point A to point B like yeah we make those things or we don't make those things life makes those things but maybe we can augment them by adding on some other stuff. Um, you're laughing at oh no! I just, I just read the uh, humans are just pretentious biofilms too. I'm like, yep, yep, that's. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I do, I do want to also speak to that. Like, I, I'm not sure about the efficiency comparisons, mm -hmm. right? Like, because uh, we have talked about this before that hydrogen production is something that's done in methan methanotrophs, mm. right? Like things that eat methane they can also produce hydrogen. Yeah. And so, and we talked a little bit about that where, um, actually that was last week when we had the cable bacteria yeah. are like these bacteria that link in an electrical way, the anoxic and the oxic zones that allow these types of methanotrophic or methanogenic uh, reactions to happen easier. Um, so yeah, so that could be a synthetic biology, right? Right. That goes down. I mean, I think this is also synthetic biology yeah. in many ways. I, I feel yeah. like, this kind of experiment ends the moment the algal cell tries to divide. So I'm. Um, That's so, true. <laughs> so I, I do feel like this is somewhat limited. This is more like a, a testing out of thing. I, I don't think mm. this is like. I don't think they're developing this into a viable technology. I think it's just testing, seeing, like pushing this reaction to a certain a area, and then we can look for other things afterwards. Um, Interesting. I mean, I'm just imagining like really complicated chemical factories where like one of their inputs is like a bioreactor that's making algal cells and then it goes through this whole coating process and it goes into these batch reactions that then make hydrogen. So mm. it, in my imagination, I was imagining it as like like something they're doing. But um, but, but I will say it is weird. They they use like an artificial electron carrier at some point. Right. Like yeah. um, instead of like NADH, which is something really common inside of cells, they have their own electron carriers that they're putting into the media. And so um, this particular cell form, like speaking, when you're saying like it ends when the bacteria tries to divide or the, the, uh, the algal, the algae tries to divide. That's very true. I think it's more than that. They're like almost being kept in like a zombie form. Like they're, they're only being used for the membrane that they made. Um, <laughs> And after that, they're trying to do everything else externally on that membrane. Yeah, I, I don't think they're thinking anything about the economics of this in terms of like hydrogen production. I think this is purely to test their hypotheses on how yeah. how this uh, photosynthetic reaction can be pushed to do different things. Yeah, yep. And I do agree with uh, Quirdo in the comments. Like this is like very much like algae as a black box. Like right, like they have put together the right mix of proteins and you know configuration that makes certain things happen and then you're just kind of like working around the bio biological reactions mm. to try to augment it in some way yeah which is again very interesting interesting way to view microbiology yeah. um and, and an interesting way to view the control of it for whatever purposes <laughs> yeah uh i think i'm going to move on to the next paper now unless we've got anything else to say yeah let's let's move on so next paper is uh, titled Fortuitously Compatible Protein Surfaces Primed Allosteric Control in Cyanobacterial Pho Photoprotection. Mm -hmm. So this kind of falls on from the other protein like interaction studies we had before, but I, I messed up and put it in this uh, section of the list rather than the other section. So, <laughs> um, but this is talking about um, cyanobacterial photoprotection from, so, so photoactive organisms must protect themselves from like getting too much light. So mm. in cyanobacteria, that prediction is caused by or orange carotenoid protein, which is 
is there to like kind of uh, shield them from some of the damage that having too much light can have. Yeah, it's their sunscreen. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, auto it's their sunscreen. sunscreen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and so this can this needs to be put under like a certain level of control. So, um, so the the has like two forms so that went after it interacts with light. So before it interacts with light, and then after it interacts with light. I think mm -hmm. so. It kind of like gets into a excited state, and then it has to um, go into. Yeah, and I think it's like the excited state that it goes into is it's because it like absorbed energy. So it, yeah, like goes to excite. So it needs something to then like vent out of that energy, so it can return back to its base state. Um, and that's the that's the uh, sunscreen protection, right? Is like absorbing that energy and then let it leave, it, venting it off in a way that doesn't damage DNA or like damage other proteins. <laughs> yeah, and standing as like a middleman in this process is this thing called FR, which hmm. so I think like so this OCP can passively recover and. Ex and like releases energy the other way, but FRP apparently controls uh, it, mm -hmm. but only in like one one type. So there's a type of OCP called OCP one that's found in some species, and FRP one kind of attaches to them and uh, controls whether how quickly they can recover. Um, so I think that they basically accelerate the recovery, so that so it can go quickly back into like the inactive state, so it can be reused more quicker. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. And what they found in, through their genetic studies was that FRP was was acquired laterally, later, acquired from like laterally. So I guess that means it wasn't evolved itself inside a bacteria. It was trans transferred over by from another related bacteria, possibly biophages or various other kind of elements that have other ways that genes can transfer between bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so, what is interesting about this paper is this is just a. It seems like the authors are more interested in the theoretical implications of what does it mean to have, like, um, like yeah, what does it mean to have a, a protein evolve to bind to a, a part of another part of a protein that's not the active site? Like, they're really they're really wondering, and, and FRP and OCP is their model system for understanding, right? Like, uh, is it that there has to be a protein that exists first that associates with this one? Or is it like, yeah, or is there like a pre-existing compatibility, something like that, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to that uh, phage tail protein in the other paper where mm -hmm. we, a protein transfers over to another organism and what does it do? And we don't really, and it can end up being, say, a structural protein, it can end up doing having a function similar to what it had in a virus. And here, it seems to have acquired what seems to be a completely new function. Um, mm -hmm. where, so they did some studies on FRP. So they looked, tried to find out where it came from. And I think it came from uh, glowy gliobacteria, which are sister to bacteria. Bac no, hold on a minute. Let me double check. I misread my words there. But the FRP group came from a different uh, set of bacteria that weren't necessarily. So they came from proteobacteria and acidobacteria. Mm -hmm. So that's and and the thing is, people don't actually know what they do in proteobacteria and acidobacteria. But what they found uh -huh. was that when they, they, they did a couple of things where they, they rolled back the clock. So they predicted what the structure, the ancient version of these structures were. So what would, so like, what would the original FRB, original OCP have looked like? So and an interesting part of this paper was where they tried to predict uh, what the original OCP looked like before FRP was transferred over to that. And the same thing. Mm. So essentially trying to roll that clock back to recreate that moment where the first version of FRP met the first version of OCP. And seeing what whether they whether they actually interacted or not, or whether there was some evolution that needed to happen in order for them to build that relationship, and what they found right. was weird because what they found was that the moment they put these versions with together, they immediately yep. formed that relationship. Um, uh huh. Yeah. So it's like it's almost it the the hypothesis they're trying to uh, uh, develop there is that it's only the it's the accidental right association of two things that then can maybe like start uh, be the nucleus for functions to emerge. But it's just like, yeah, they have to already sort of just be by chance something that might touch each other in, in, a, in a certain way. Yeah, I mean, I can see how they'd almost built this up this paper to not have that. So they were expecting that to be like the negative control and then they'd map the, cause they did a lot of work on like what OCP was like before and after. And mm -hmm. then it would be, 
I mean, it would have been really interesting if the, there wasn't a relationship in the, the ancestral versions. And then once that happened, they could like model how that had developed. Mm -hmm. But the fact that the, that the relationship was there almost immediately changed the paper a lot. And yeah. uh, so they looked at the interface between these two proteins to see what, what where it, so they looked at like the FRP proteins in, that have continued to evolve in other versions of bacteria, which haven't ever interacted with FRP. Mm -hmm. CP, and they found that there is that interaction space. So there is this site that could bind to OCP in certain mm -hmm. situations. Mm -hmm. And so that's very interesting. But I think there is a missing part of this paper because they don't know what FRP's function is and what that active site does in FRP's like normal lifestyle. So yep. it could be that it binds to a similar protein. It has a function that is related to o OCP. So there was almost like this pre- uh, the potential for that relationship to happen but yeah, yeah so again this is in some ways just like the phage tail paper there's like a little bit of a mystery right in this like you can't tell yeah. the whole story of like why these two things were associating because like there's some there's more questions to ask uh, at that level um and yeah like it also makes me wonder like was it like if we look at like the ancestral tail protein or whatever right that moved over into the uh, strep, strep, strep. Yeah, I think that's what it moves yeah. into. Like, does it already have an affinity for certain things, or does it gain that affinity right through exposure? Uh, is there like a generalized surface that's like the affinity surface that gives it like more likely to associate with different things? Um, yeah, but I mean, I don't think either paper's scope to ask answer those big questions, but but these are like examples that drive those questions in my own head. Yeah, I mean, I, I still feel like it's important to understand what FRP's like ancestral life is and what it does, but that's mm -hmm. because I've already got this built-in skepticism because I don't believe in love and first sight, so I don't believe that these enzymes will like, <laughs> look across the room like immediately. So, but star-crossed enzymes, star-crossed enzymes. <laughs> the thing is, like, evolution does work a lot on fuck-ups and and strange things that happen uh -huh. by chance. So, they something like this is bound to have happened but yeah mm -hmm. i i'm very interested to find out more about this story um, yeah yeah <laughs> all right um now moving on to the coral segment of our of our show <laughs> yeah so somebody got a bit anxious about climate change while researching these papers and <laughs> so we've now got all coral papers now um <laughs> which, which i love me. Uh, yeah but i do love corals because they are this um this model holobiont, right? Like they are mm. a eukaryotic organism that has algae that it needs to do photosynthesis out of its body, typically. Um, and so like the relationship between these organisms and their symbiotes is like a, a key. Yeah, they're like, like <laughs> they're like the lichens of the sea in my mind. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, exactly. This, I mean, they, they have that so, such interesting symbiosis with bacteria. Mm -hmm. And with sea levels rising and, like, well, not sea levels rising, they, water temperatures rising, especially this year. I don't know if you've seen the news, but people are panicking about about sea, about sea mm. water temperatures. And things that, when temperatures get warmer, coral bleaching events. And mm -hmm. and that means mm -hmm. they, they inject eject a lot of their symbiotes. And uh, one of the things that this paper's looking at is particularly are the viruses that infect sim symbiotes. So... The dinoflagellar RNA viruses, I think they they talk they talk they talk about here, and what they a couple of like bleaching events that happen that happening in various parts of the South Pacific, um, and they try and characterize what the virus level during these bleaching events, um, mm -hmm. and and then also associate that with the underlying health of the corals during these events. Yeah, and so what this mostly is is a uh, a look at like the temperature fluctuations, the the reaction, like how that relates to the bleaching events, and also how that relates to the viruses that uh, are infecting the the partners of the coral. So they, they aren't infecting the corals themselves; they're infecting the algae that are basically feeding the corals. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so they again, we look at they, they look at the major capsid protein to look at the diversity of viruses that are infecting <coughs> um, the corals, and they find that they're. I think there is a much higher diversity that happens during bleaching events, if I recall correctly. Let me check correct whether that I was right on that or not. Um, uh, but 
yeah, because the, the idea is that some your some viruses do contribute to bleaching signs, and and so uh, yeah, I think yeah, the species richness uh, and composition like changes as a result of the the bleaching of well, well no, not as a result of that's the wrong word, but they correlate with the correlate. bleaching events. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. So. Uh, and so it's really so just this... it's, so it's already known that like with heat comes increased bleaching, and so this this study is really adding us another layer on top of this, right? Saying that okay, well during bleaching we're also like maybe secreting more of our symbiotes, in, right? We're like regurgitating our symbiotes into the water column, right? And that might also drive stress related events of those to have like viral blooms, um, like in those endosymbionts. So yeah, it's like just another layer describing that this, uh, I guess, not so great scenario of, of coral, of coral bleaching. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the big date there is, I think the big foot one for the bleaching event is on, uh, March the, the 19th in terms of like the daily mean temperatures. And they measure different parts of the reef, uh, mm -hmm. at different depths to see how they're affected by it. Mm -hmm. And it, it looks like they, that during the during like the bleaching event, there is a fair, fairly high diversity of viruses, and th th that continues afterwards for a bit. Um, and so, uh, this is an interesting look at coral mortality. But uh, and that think, speaking about coral mortality, that brings us to the next paper, which is the paper that that really caught my eye: consumer feces impact coral health in gill-specific ways. Um, <laughs> This, this is the paper this, that started off your coral binge, or <laughs> yeah, this is what started off the coral binge. So, well, actually, there was a last paper that started off the coral binge that led to this paper and this paper. So, I'm doing this in backwards order in terms of the most interesting papers, um, <laughs> because this paper is about fish feces. Now, fish they don't get out of the water to poop. I've just learned, and yeah. <laughs> what, what they and they they apparently they they hover over corals and they they poop in what is referred to as uh, a persistent rain of feces. Let me see if I can find that in the phrase yeah. they use in this paper, a persistent rain of feces. Uh, <laughs> and these feces transmit microorganisms, and those microorganisms can be beneficial or, or not beneficial. Um, and corals are fin filter feeders, so they would just take... And so mm -hmm. there is a potential for coral feces to spread pathogenic bacteria or could spread bacteria that, that will partner with the, with the corals. Um, and totally. uh, I, I do want to say, like, that persistent rain of feces, though, like, it, uh, I've heard, like, uh, what you, ocean, oceanic snow, what do people say? Like, yeah, in the snow. open ocean, it's like marine snow. It's like a, it's a big nutrient source. Um, so, like, this is, like, what happens when, instead of pooping in the open ocean, they're pooping in the reef. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, the, the, the hypothesis that the authors are little, whether what the fish are eating can affect what is the how healthy things are for the coral so there are some fish that eat the corals directly um mm -hmm. and then there are some that eat like detritus and they they great and are grazers um mm -hmm. and the theory was that the fish that eat coral are more beneficial for the corals because they're basically eating the the symbionts that are already in the coral so when they go down when they start pooping out all those bacteria are already kind of beneficial to the coral whereas grazers and detritus are more likely to have have things that come from dead corals, perhaps, and then that they're spreading like things that might be more detrimental to corals. Um, mm -hmm. So they look at like the difference between like microbial act activity in grazer versus detrivores, and they they do so they extract the feces from fish and they sterilize them and test to sterilize them against fresh feces to see what happens to the coral. And yeah, it's... just essentially laying a piece of feces, right? They have like little coral sections, they lay some feces on it and they wait for a little bit and then they like brush it off and they look like what happened underneath the, <laughs> the settled feces on this coral. Um, and I think if they show that like the, it's the coral, the, the feces from coral derived um, fish, eating fish, like they, they aren't as hurtful, they aren't as harmful to the underlying coral as, as others. Yeah. And the detrivores are tend to be the worst fish for for that. Um, where they measured like the lesion size on the polyps and find that generally with the detrivores the lesions are much bigger. Mm -hmm. So be good or or not bad for, for fish. I'm not right. going to go as far as saying they're beneficial, but um, mm -hmm. they definitely like sell the sell the point that don't poop on coral, please. Um, 
but but I will also say that the authors they they are also they also recognize in the discussion that you know in in their experiment like they're just like static tanks mm. where the poop like sits nicely on the coral but uh, and they do they say that it, you can observe that in nature sometimes but also there's also currents and stuff right like moving things around yeah so like it might not be like this exact like maybe this exact thing happens sometimes but mainly I guess it's a way of uh, exploring the relationship between the coral eating fish and corals like a little bit closer because mm. if there is some sort of thing where it's like they're eating the bacteria and they deposit it like that chance event <laughs> that could still be happening even if it's not actually like you know the, the difference in how these species hurt the coral isn't like super significant but it's like a marker of something that like another biological relationship maybe it, yeah and I think the important thing is is also like whether they can actually benefit the corals because I think anything that could potentially mm -hmm. save corals is very like interesting and important. So the idea that coral of all right. poop can, might be beneficial for them that's an interesting idea. Um, mm -hmm. But speaking of saving corals, that, that brings us to the next paper, which is chemical and genomic characterization of potential pro probiotic treatment for stony coral tissue loss disease. Mm -hmm. So yeah, another mystery. So stony coral tissue loss disease is 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 responsible for like ver various coral bleaching events um so i think like over 20 species of corals along florida's coral reef has been affected by uh, mortality events uh, caused by stony coral tissue loss disease the problem is the actual agent that causes it remains unknown uh there is evidence to suggest that some pathogenic bacteria are involved so there are bacteria like vibrio coralliticus which is associated with some of the more virulent uh, lesions caused by this disease. Mm -hmm. But the actual like trigger is not yet known. But because we know, because the people have already got the suggestion that bacteria are involved, there are mitigation strategies such as using antibiotics on corals. So you, so there, there's uh, a coral a paste of like amoxicillin that the people have been using to spread on corals to try and limit the damage caused by stony coral tissue loss disease. Yep. Um, it's kind of wild. Uh, like, I don't want, this almost reminds me of like when people use antibiotics in animals to make them bigger, right? And it's like you don't, you know, like a little bit, like it works, but you're not quite sure the mechanism. Um, but like, you know, the outcome is something that you want. Uh, yeah. Anyways, for obvious reasons, yeah. they'd like to move away from using antibiotics, like spreading antibiotic paste in the ocean. Yeah. So they were looking for a uh, potential probiotic. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is a, a, and I think what they did was they looked, they screened for corals that had survived stony coral tissue loss disease and That's looked right. for the bacteria that were within them. Mm -hmm. And then they put, played those bacteria out to see like whether they could kill off the, like, uh, uh, like the bacteria associated with coral tissue loss disease. So mm -hmm. could they kill off Vibro coralliticus or other like things that they'd seen there? And if they could, then potentially could they give those bacteria to coral? to protect them from SCTLD. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they find, they do find a bacteria and it creates this whole class of um, peptides, coromycins. Um, yeah. And, and those are thought to be the active compounds. I, I guess they already know that these compounds exist. It's more them finding a certain strain of bacteria that makes a whole bunch of them. Right? It's like, oh, this one makes a lot. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And they, they found that this could like slow or like stop le progression of lesions in, in corals. So they grew these corals up in, in the lab and they they treated them. And not only that, what they found was that if they gave them to the corals that were touching other that were. So they took one bit of disease coral and attached it to a healthy bit of coral to see whether this uh, could protect against the the disease spread. Not only did they find they could protect against the, the healthy coral, it also limited the, even though the, the disease coral hadn't been treated by the bacteria, they hadn't been given the bacteria, that mm -hmm. that, that the disease coral ended up living lo longer just by being in contact with the coral that had been treated with the probiotic. So mm -hmm. that is quite a good sign. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think really interesting. I like, it's so... I found, I found this paper interesting from the standpoint of like the way that they don't know everything about the disease, but they kind of have like a bunch of good guesses. And then through like the application of their techniques, they, they find a, a magical bacterium that really like helps in, in many ways. Um, 
Yeah, and I wonder whether or not, like, just studying this bacteria more and its interaction with coral may also provide some answers to what's going on mechanistically. Um, and but but of course, like, I'm almost like super. I, I'm really pleased that they're able to go down this line of thought because anything to reduce antibiotics mm -hmm. that we're using, I think, is quite helpful. Um, just because, yeah, like making a lot of those compounds, like we know how that has affected human health. Like, I mean, it's given us amazing, right? Like we don't have to worry about certain infectious diseases anymore, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's also uncovered other issues, right? Where antibiotic resistance is uh, coming up in certain uh, environments. And so, um, yeah, exploring some of the alternatives, I think, is like always a valuable line of research. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I think that brings us to the end of our list of papers. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. Um, yeah. Uh, we'll be back. Um, wait, not in two weeks, right? Almost. No. We, yeah. We're taking some time off. Uh, we're mm -hmm. going to be back on uh, June the 4th, I think, is our next uh, available date. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. June the 4th, that's like almost, well, how many weeks? i got to count it. One, that's two, gonna three, be four. Four weeks. Four weeks away. Four so, weeks away. Uh, in the, <laughs> yeah. Um, we want to remind uh, everyone that while we're very enthusiastic about microbiology and somewhat qualified, it's possible we didn't get everything right. Science is about thinking critically and asking the right questions. So if you have any questions or corrections, please let us know in the comments. Yep, I totally agree. You can reach out to us over Twitter or Mastodon. We both believe that peer review is a process and it requires folks to actually read the papers um, to make it work. So if you think of something to add or you found something unclear, let us know. <laughs> yes, it's been a pleasure chatting with you, Danny, and thank you to Quedo in the comments. It's been very fun reading them. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so tune in four weeks where we'll see some more microbiology content. Yeah, see you then. Goodbye. Bye-bye.